underneath everyone's chair right now is an envelope. The envelope looks something like, you good? All right, it looks something like this. And in that envelope is $5 million in cash. Do not move. It's $5 million in cash. Now, you can grab that envelope, and you can take that cash, and you can walk out this door right now. It's your cash. Or, in this envelope, I have 100 slips of paper. And on 90 of these slips of paper, do not look under your chair. I see some of you doing it. <laughs> on 90 of those slips of paper, it says $5 million, just like what's underneath your chair. On nine of those slips of paper, it says $25 million. And on one of these slips of paper, it says $0. You have the option of taking the $5 million and walking out right now, or you can come up, pull a number out of the envelope, and you can take a risk. Maybe you get $25 million. Maybe you get $0. Again, there's 90 of them are five, nine of them are 25, and one of them is zero dollars. So I need to see a show of hands. How many people are just going to take the five million dollars right now? Come on, raise them up. How many people are going to take the risk and go for the 25? See, that's really interesting. So this is actually a real question about risk. That was Ron, um, the guys who wrote you know, the idea behind prospect theory, Daniel uh, Kahneman and Amos Tversky, the idea of prospect theory. This is the Senior Living Innovation Forum. We talk about innovation, which means you need to take risks. And the vast, when they ask this exact same question, about two thirds to three fourths of the people would actually take the five million dollars every time. And only one third would actually take the risk. So everybody look underneath their chair and you can get your five million dollars right now. <laughs> there's, there's that, never mind. <laughs> this is the Senior Living Innovation Forum, not the Senior Living Gullibility Forum. So why are we talking about risk? That notion is, okay, we, we heard everything Bob said. What about, are, are we actually willing to take the choices, make the choices, to take the risk to do what we need to do to change? Or are we just going to be happy with the status quo? So we have a group of people up here who I think everybody knows in the interest of time, we won't do a lot of, a lot of introductions. Uh, but these are people that have known to take a little bit of risk in their careers, with their companies, and they're, they're tackling some of the issues um, you know, that, that are very prevalent, which Bob's talking about. You know, so Kai runs Eclipse. Kai, how many buildings? You have what, about 100 some odd buildings? We're at uh, 100 and over 110. OK, so. 110. So Patricia will with Belmont. They, you all have what, 30. 30? They're gorgeous. If you haven't been into Belmont community, you need to do that. We, we know Bob. Now, I'm actually going to give a little time to Chris. Um, so Chris is, is actually, this is kind of your coming out party. Right, so Chris has wow, been in the industry party. all of, of uh, all of six months. Chris's background was with the White House, and then he spent years uh, basically driving the, helping to drive the growth of Starbucks. Uh, and then about a few months back, he uh, he decided to switch over to senior living. So the first question, you know, we obviously have is, you know, dude, what what the heck? Uh, give us a little bit of background. How how you got into senior housing from Starbucks? Well, I you know, uh, thank you for the coming out party. It was fantastic. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, you know. I've had good dramatic changes in my career. I worked government for a while. I worked in finance. And then I then I found this little company called Starbucks in Seattle, 16 years ago, and had the real opportunity to join that company. When we had a thousand stores, and we thought that was just gigantic, and today Starbucks has 30,000 stores across the world. We grew that thing remarkably quickly. Um, but along that journey, I lost a lot of what attracted me to Starbucks in the in the beginning. Um, great company for a lot of reasons, but um, it got very big very quick. And I, I guess the reason I've come to senior living, I, I began to look at seniors at Starbucks. That we looked at seniors almost as hard as we did at millennials, uh, because as Bob just said, they're a giant market. And I saw what was happening, and I'd always kind of followed the market, um, and I was intrigued, really intrigued actually. Um, and I saw the opportunity to selfishly, obviously, take advantage of the business opportunity that exists, but um, mostly got into it for the same reasons I'm sure many of you did, for, for the purpose part of it. Uh, I came from a family who had a lot of dementia and Alzheimer's on it. Uh, I put my grandmother twice uh, in some uh, really unfortunate places, to be honest with you. I grew up in Arkansas where we didn't have, uh, we didn't have a lot of the options that we have today, and it bothered me deeply. It was the guilt. I understood it. Um, and I think the options today to really uh, 
you know, make a big impact. And there's a lot of retail corollaries here, right, in terms of creating experiences for customers. Um, exist in senior living. And I saw that very clearly, and I love the purpose behind it. And aside from all that, it's, it's the biggest challenge we're going to face in the next 50 years. I understand that. Um, certainly financially, uh, as, com as a country. But, uh, and, we, and we seem, I'll, I'll say this to be provocative maybe, uh, and we all know this, but we're vastly unprepared for what's coming. And I think the opportunity to jump into a challenge of that size at a very early stage, I realize all of you have been doing this for a very long time, and I don't want to discount that at all. Uh, but I feel like I'm getting in on the ground floor, and that's why I'm here. And uh, I like big challenges, and uh, this feels like one to me and one that I am uh, really very excited about. I'll just add, uh, again, something you all do every day but is new to me. Uh, I love Starbucks because we were so people-focused. I mean, that's what we did. We were on the front line supporting, uh, we call everybody a partner who works at Starbucks. But uh, I, I just completed my immersion at Aegis, and I went and I worked as a care manager in every building we have over the last five months. And I have to say that I, you know, I knew I would get very excited about taking care of older people. But the night before I was going to work my first shift in Seattle, I was very nervous, very nervous, about going and doing the hands-on care. And I, I got to uh, one of our communities at 6.15 in the morning that next morning, and this woman named Helen, this just amazing Eritrean woman, 28 years old, had only been with us for six months. She didn't care who I was, never heard of me. She just took my hand, and we just started waking up little old ladies, and taking them to the bathroom and showering them and holding their hand, taking them to breakfast. And I just thought that was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. And I have fallen in love with the business, I, you know, uh, particularly from that part of it. And I cannot wait to get started. So. Thank you for the question. I hope yeah. that. No, that's, that's great. Like kind of an undercover boss uh, for us. So, <laughs> um, so a, a year ago, a lot of us were in, at least the room in Napa, we talked about disruption and what's going to disrupt us. And if, if we have a crystal ball, what does that look like? We're not going to ask the crystal ball question because invariably someone will say, well, if I had a crystal ball, I wouldn't be here. And, and that just gets frustrating for all of us. But uh, we are going to take a little bit from that. So we, we talked about last year, you know, oh, things are coming, things are going to, you know, Amazon may disrupt us, things may come from outside the industry, we may disrupt ourselves from inside the industry. But if you start, like, let's, let's do a recap over the past year uh, of things that are already happening, that are disrupting us. So, you know, Bob, to reiterate what Bob talked about, plus we have things, you know, Medicare Advantage, the post-acute alignment, healthcare alignment, this is all starting to happen. You know, study after study after study is now talking about labor shortages. How do we tackle labor problems? Uh, you know, we have an increase in multifamily entrants who want to get into this you know, age-restricted multifamily. Uh, our occupancy stats in the past year have not really changed materially. Um, and then large portfolios of operators or, or portfolios of, of communities have shifted from one operator to another operator. There's been a lot of disruption over the past year. So there's a lot of things going on that are already disrupting our industry. So the, the question of the panel is, based on you know, these factors and the things that Bob has talked about, what are those things that you are, you know, you are tackling in your own space? What do you think is the most material? And what are you tackling in your own space? What are, where are you taking that risk right now in your own organizations? I'll take that and talk about two things. One is going to be very controversial in this room because so many of us are bricks and mortar operators. Um, I think our industry has made a lot of bad real estate. Um, uh, we, we have viewed the senior apartment as a sad little room uh, where you get put um, and you look out on the horizon at that endless stream of studios with no place to put your stuff, no place for a lady to fix up in the morning, um, very ADA oriented. And I think the multifamily guys who are coming into this space with a lot of living experience present a huge challenge that we have to rise to. We have to remake ourselves for some place where people want to live and not just get put. So I think that a lot of real estate is physically obsolete. I think how you make it in the future is going to have to be different. And if you have a bunch already, I think you have to remake it for the generation that's coming, but even for the seniors who are there now. I moved my 93-year-old mother into one of our units, 
And as I situated her in the largest, she wouldn't move until the largest apartment in the building was available. And as I situated her in that largest apartment, and she said, why is all this space between the toilet and the sink? Where is my counter space? Where do I put my computer? 93. A little bell went off, and I watch Heinz and others that are entering our space, and I say, wow, we better rise to the occasion. So for starters, it's very simple, that. The second is the use of technology in a very fundamental way. Um, yes, to make our workforce more efficient, but all of us are sitting with pull cords on a wall. We're going to the version of Alexa where the senior can have two-way communication with the other person at the end of the Cisco device, which is an iPod, so that the experience is enhanced. If you fall, it's not demeaning, and you're not having to say, how the hell do I get to the pull cord? I think it still relates to real estate, but that advent of technology and real estate is terrifically important. And if you're not on that now, you're going to have to be. It's a huge challenge. There's a lot of expense associated with it. Um, but this is going to be the future. Kai? Look, I uh, agree with Patricia here. The, the, for, you know, for, first off, I'll, you know, I'll be candid about it. You know, uh, was it Eclipse formed about a year ago? And we did so because we knew that there was going to be disruption in, in the game, uh, you know, in the, in the field, with operators, you know, um, basically, you know, coming apart at the seams because of some bad deals or triple nets or whatever. So, you know, we are a by byproduct of that. Um, with that said, you know, uh, yes. So, if you want to be a management company that takes over because of the disruption that's out there, um, you know, what do you need to do to be successful? To be, you know, maybe better than the person that you just took over for, right? You know, one is, you know, the capital structure. And I think, you know, here in senior living right now, I think we're all gonna, you know, it, the, the industry is going through a bit of a reset, because uh, I think uh, cap structure is going to be a, uh, uh, was it, uh, you know, continued uh, downfall for a lot of operators out there right now. Um, and, uh, and part of that is because, to what Patricia said, is the need for investment in technology. Um, you know, look, it's a lot easier to invest in technology if you have the capital to do so. But if you're an operator who is in a triple net lease who's barely making your rent payment or underwater, you can't invest in that technology. You know, you can't do the things that partners, you know, like, you know, healthcare systems are asking you to do. You just don't have the capital to do so. So, um, yes, it, it is going to be an interesting time in the senior living industry because people come at it from the real estate perspective. The real estate valuations haven't, you know, come to fruition, and uh, yeah, I, I think uh, you know that's going to continue to be disruptive. So, so how do how do we do that? If the capital structure is not aligned to it, how, how do we do it in such a way where we know where we have to evolve to? How do we how do we get there? Is, does there need to be a fundamental shift in our capital? Well, structure? It's, it's happening now, right? So the ones with bad cap structures are going away, and the ones with stronger cap structures are coming into the market. It's a natural capitalist evolution that's going on there right now. Uh, but you know, for, you know, for those entering the market, I think the question is, you know, how do you value your management platform? Right? A lot of developers think, think of the management platform as a loss leader. Right? I mean, really, if, you, if, you, if some of the companies out there were to value the management company as a standalone business, it would be in the red, because it's being funded by development. How do you actually you know, sort of fix that, uh, you know, that proposition there? Because um, that, that becomes sustainable, that becomes scalable, sustainable. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, you know, it's, it's happening out of uh, just pure uh, you know, attrition right now. So, so Chris, in your organization, I know you're relatively new, but w w where do you see the big risks in, in our space and how are you tackling, what, what are those big risks you're tackling in your space? Yeah, well I agree with everything that's been said. I, I think we're just checking through Bob's list that he just gave us, but uh, I, would, I would add on the partnerships piece. I mean, broadly, both in terms of um, I saw everybody's head shaking when Bob talked about uh, you know, the adult daughter who gets called from the ER. I, I agree with that, and 
Uh, we've got it, you know, it's a little bit like the coffee business. If you're not making this convenient, you are going to lose. There's no doubt about it. And I think partnerships would be a great way to do that. The other side of partnerships is getting much further upstream in terms of how we're interacting with potential uh, future families. Uh, I think, you know, we're obviously we're more acute, uh, higher acuity than uh, many more independent operators, but um, we've got to get much further upstream and not, and we got to, we got to get closer to these families well before it's crisis time. You know, these crises just create, they just, they just put us at a severe disadvantage as, a, as an industry. And, I, you know, I knew more about one of my customers at Starbucks than I do about all of my residents at Aegis. Uh, and I think that we could use data a lot smarter. I think we'd get much, much further upstream in terms of how we educate um, potential families. And I would love to play on this, this wellness theme that, you know, you called them the young old. I think I am one of those. But uh, uh, there's enormous interest in personal health right now, right? And you want to apply that to your parents and your grandparents. And I think there's a big opportunity to leverage that. I mean, there's a, uh, a book I read recently, The Alzheimer's, Solutions, Alzheimer's Solution by uh, a doctor named Shirazi in Loma Linda here. And, you know, who knew... Uh, I say this after seeing the giant roast beef display last night, but who knew meat had such a big impact potentially on dementia? And I think there's a real opportunity to get much further upstream in educating people well in advance of them making these decisions and leveraging that as a, as a, as a point of education. So uh, can I get you all to flip to the first slide over there? So we're going we're gonna to run through uh, a couple of, of case questions. I don't know. I don't, I don't have a clicker, so if you can, I don't know if you all can flip over to it. Okay, there you go. Um, with the ideas of disruption, and as an executive, you obviously have to make choices. You don't have a lot of time. So we have a lot of suppliers in the room, and it would be really interesting to hear from everybody to, to hear, okay, someone makes an appointment with you or is trying to make an appointment with you, and they come from one of five categories. They're either, they come from the building improvement world, they're designers, architects, flooring, furniture suppliers, they come from the care services like rehab, home health, fitness, spas. Uh, they come, you know, service or technology that improves staff, talent acquisition and staff retention, or their service and technology that fo focuses on resident engagement, resident and family communication and activities, or service and technology that helps improve the quality of care such as EHRs, resident monitoring, nurse call telemedicine, and care coordination. These are very broad categories, clearly, but if someone is coming to you trying to make an appointment, which type of vendor are you most likely to accept an appointment with of those five categories? Well, look, I'm not going to accept an appointment unless someone actually has an ROI case for what they're pitching. Okay. Right? I mean, look, it, it, we're a little bit different. We're a third-party management company. So you know, those kind of expenses get pushed on to our ownership groups. And the question is, do we have you know, the, uh, you know, the case to say, yeah, it makes sense and to do that. Is there an ROI for it? Uh, you know, how do we pay, you know, for this additional $40 or $50 that's going to hit your community P&L? Uh, so, yeah, if you don't have an ROI for it, then, uh, yeah, you probably haven't seen you guys. Uh, we're kind of the opposite of Kai. That yep. is to say we own everything we operate and only operate what we own. Um, and all of the above would be welcome. Uh, we have within our organization people who are assimilating everything that's new that we can either take to the buildings or the operation. But if I had to prioritize here, it would be two. And the first would be uh, talent acquisition and staff retention. We have transformed internally how we do that. Um, the advent of something called Great Place to Work has been a very, very welcome thing within our organization, not only because Fortune me measures it and puts you on a list and certifies you, but because you get a wealth of data on how to improve um, your culture, your staff retention, um, and it's incredibly powerful if you learn to use it. Uh, with respect to care technologies, I just began to talk about some. But in this era of focusing on health, not health care, uh, we believe that technology is going to be used extensively, will be critically important. 
Uh, we just formed a partnership with the largest uh, healthcare system in South Florida. Um, one that's very interesting because they're financially invested in the true partnership. Um, so there's an economic uh, alignment of interest. Um, but we are actively pressing the envelope, not only on senior health and wellness, but the advent of telemedicine in our communities, which we'll take elsewhere. Uh, but we're pioneering it with them. And I think that stuff is, is anybody who has that stuff here, I'm going to listen to Dr. Wong later, um, is music to our ears. Chris? Yeah, I would, I would answer that very similarly. I mean, I have talent acquisition staff retention being very, very top on my list. Um, I think especially, you know, thinking more even broadly about what that means, culture building, you know, more unique and interesting, you know, ways to engage people on their benefits, right? I mean, I think there's sort of hygiene factors of 401ks and healthcare and all that sort of thing. But then there's a whole nother sort of uh, chapter that needs to be written around unique engagement tactics for people in our business. I mean, uh, and this doesn't fit in this conversation, but obviously we're all... I mean, I look at my daughter, I got a nine year old daughter, and she's going to work in healthcare. There's no doubt in my mind about it because she's going to have to. And I look at retail, for instance, another big pool of people that you know, we're targeting very hard, right? Starbucks has got some great people who would be fantastic in healthcare. Um, and they're going to be in healthcare because retail is getting smaller. There are these pools of people out there, right, that are getting much smaller, and they're going to come to us, but we've got a big opportunity but a big challenge in making this much, much more attractive as a career opportunity. Um, I mean, I, I, so I think anything that does that better, we're gonna be super interested in, and I could go on all about that all day, but um, yeah, I think that's probably okay. what I would answer. So real, show of hands real fast, how many are here uh, owner operators, uh, equity owners in senior housing? I know there's more than that, okay. So it, to pull that crew, if you all had to make a choice of one of these five, who would go, who, who would most likely take the meeting with the building improvement folks? Like none of y'all. <laughs> uh, okay, who Okay. Who owns real estate? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to, if you could only choose one, if you could only choose one, what would be the most likely? Would it be building improvement? I'll repeat. We're dealing with a very small segment of the population, uh, roughly 16% of the population. <laughs> and uh, and uh, building improvements are where a huge part of our cost really relates to as well as operations. But uh, I would say that building improvements and operations are really at the center of the community for the community of Portland. So his, his comments were that building improvements can be necessary to make it affordable in the future. Is that Um, real fast, we'll go through these. Um, who would be really excited to have a conversation with a vendor from care services? If you're an owner operator. So none. Hmm. <laughs> what about talent acquisition and staff retention? Okay, that's really interesting. Uh, resident family engagement, communication and activities. Okay. And then care technologies, EHRs, resident monitoring. So the last three are the ones that seem to get a little, a little buzz. Okay, let's in the interest of time, we're going to skip, um, skip to the next, next slide real fast. So this is going to be uh, kind of an abstract question. You have $10,000 to spend. Are you going to spend it on improving your building, or are you going to spend it on improving your care? You can only choose one. Real fast, lightning round. Well, look, my, the owners of my buildings are going to do it on the building. I'm going to do it on okay. the care. OK. I'm going to do it on the workforce and say, if I only have 10000 bucks. Use it on the workforce. Okay. Same. Bob? I would do it on things that 
uh, enhance my frontline staff, feeling that I'm investing in them to enable to deliver better for the people they're caring for. Okay. So let's go to the next slide. So the last case question here. Now this, this, is, um, this is a hypothetical. You are an operator of a building. This could be any of them. <laughs> the building is 10 years old. It's nice. It's in a nice growing suburban market. It is 84% occupied. It's in a competitive submarket. The building is nice enough, but after 10 years, it is starting to show some wear and tear. You don't really have an EHR, and your Wi-Fi was installed by the original developer's nephew for $5,000 in a case of Pabst Blue Ribbon. <laughs> Employee turnover is over 50% a year, which is around the industry average, and over time, it's about 10% of wages. An apartment developer really wants to take advantage of this quote unquote silver tsunami and thinks he has the perfect design for a 120 unit ILAL memory care, complete with design features that no one has ever seen like a town hall, a bistro, and a concierge. <laughs> he will be opening in about a year, about two miles away from your facility. Your building owner, let's call him H.C. Ventower, has graciously approved, I think I borrowed that from Stephen Rowe, has graciously approved a $150,000 CapEx allocation for your building for the year 2020. <laughs> you doubt you will get this CapEx allocation for at least another five years. However, there are stipulations. You can only invest in one and only one of the following choices. Next slide, please. You can spend it on A. You can spend it all on a new common area carpet, dining furniture, and a few public area furniture pieces. Option B, you can spend it all on replacing your Pabst Blue Ribbon Wi-Fi network and install a state-of-the-art EHR complete with point-of-care documentation and some workflow automation as well as a resident monitoring platform with predictive analytics that can help you provide more timely and preventative care. Option C, you can invest it all on a new state-of-the-art, just-in-time staff training system. You can hire additional training leaders and build out a really cool employee break room. Or D, you can spend it all in replacing your Wi-Fi network again and investing in a complete build-out of an in-room Alexa-based voice-activated resident engagement platform complete with activity management, digital signage, concierge integration, resident reminders, and room automation. It will include a robust virtual reality resident engagement module that has received significant accolades from the Alzheimer's Association as well as other clinical research organizations and its studies have shown that this integrated program will increase resident satisfaction by 21%. So, you have one, you have $150,000 CapEx allocation. Do you spend it on A, B, C, or D? Who wants to go first? Well, let me tell you what it costs to do all of the above because we're doing it. No, I, okay. It's between two and three million bucks a yeah. community. Yeah. Um, uh, some communities as much as five. Um, the first thing I would do before any of these is would look at the tenure of my leadership team and the tenure of my employees and put a great big, great place to work together with celebrating the tenure of my staff to go against the new guy. Because if I can celebrate my people and demonstrate that for 15 years we've had the same continuity of leadership in the community and get testimonials, I'm not worried about the new resi guy, no matter what my paint and carpet looks like. Um, we project who we are and what we do um, through our customers and through our workforce. Um, past that, if I were tattered, I'd go for the new paint and carpet. And the reason is that someone is coming to live with us and it ought to be uplifting. And if, you have not, if, if it's old and tattered and ugly, um, it gets back to the pejorative that Bob was talking about. Um, needs to be inside the apartments as well as the chandeliers, but at a minimum, nobody wants to see tattered park carpet and furniture that's falling apart uh, and looks like it belongs at Goodwill. Yeah, I, he keeps giving Bob, so I, I don't know if he's going to vote. But I, I, it's not, at the, at the, at the uh, risk of being super simplistic, I would invest in the training tech and training leadership. I wouldn't put it in a cool new break room. Uh, I think we have those. Um, 
But I, I think that it's never about, it's never about, I mean, certainly design and the building and amenities are all really important in, in, in our business, but uh, it's how you feel. I mean, as a newcomer to this business, when you walk into a, a community, you know how it feels and you're watching care. Mm -hmm. And there's no doubt in my mind that you can compete with anybody who's building a big new fancy building uh, if you can compete on care, and that's where I would put the money. Patricia, go again. Can I just say something about break rooms? Because this is very interesting. <laughs> um, so we built a building a few years ago that's operating now for two years in Mexico City. And in Mexico City, uh, you're sort of cradled to grave with respect to your employees because you've got to have locker rooms. They commute from two hours away um, to come to work. They get into their uniforms and take showers there. You have an employee cafeteria. We have a full service laundry, et cetera. So I got to thinking about this, and, and we have fabulous break room. And I got to thinking about this, and I did a little tour of our break rooms back in America and said, wow, you know, we renovate and we don't think enough about, you know, we know we have obligatory meal breaks in California and you better give them, but we don't think about enough about where people go. So we started a program, all kidding aside, of renovating break rooms and uh, taking out spaces and doing some fun stuff and putting up mirrors with a smile on them and just playing with what we'd done in Mexico City. And it has been remarkable. So don't give what up sort of on feedback, What sort of feedback have you gotten from employees? Uh, they love it. Um, they're grateful. Um, they uh, never wanted to go to the bathroom inside the break room where everybody could hear them. They, you know, now we're unisex bathrooms anyway in most places. So we delivered space. We delivered better cooking space. We sort of had some fun with food options. And I got to tell you, if you're concerned about your culture and your workforce, the $100,000 that you spend on the break room may be the best money spent, and yet it's in the back of the house. But it speaks to who works there. And that idea actually came from Mexico City. <laughs> uh, you're, you're noticeably silent. Yeah, well, look, the, the reality is you probably have 10 communities that fall into this bucket. Right. So uh, you look at the market studies, and you probably sell two of them. So you use the monies from those two that you're selling or the three that you're selling and put them in the rest of the seven. So Because that, that dollar amount's not going to get you in much. So. And if I could just add, I would um, make sure that whatever decision, it wasn't just a top-down decision. I would involve my employees, particularly my frontline employees. I believe they're the key. They're e we're either strong or terrible based upon our frontline employees. So I want them to feel that I'm investing in them to be able to, because I think most of them want to be able to do an even better job. And am I investing in them? So, but. I think you got to ask them. Doesn't mean you're going to go exactly with what they want. I'm not saying that. But I, I think it's critically important that I think one of the problems is uh, people come to conferences like this, go back with great ideas, and say, we're going to do X. And they haven't really engaged the employees. And the employees have the, oh, yeah, they went to the, I can tell it was some technology conference. Now, now we're going to all do this. And, you know, what's this idiot think I do every day? Just sit around and wait for them to come back from conferences with the newest idea that somehow or another is going to be added on to the eight plus hours I already work. And so I, I just, I, I, think, I think we have to be careful of that mentality and engage our employees so that they feel bought in to wherever we're making this investment. Yeah. Bob, I'm gonna give you the last word, uh, last question. Based on what you're seeing and all the observations we heard you make, where are we not taking enough risk as an industry? My, if I, my simple answer is uh, we're not taking a risk on, the, um, on who the people are that are living in our communities. We're thinking of them differently than they want to be thought of. And I think when we start changing that framework, and these are all important areas. I mean, and I would also argue it's a reason why scale is important, because, and I think Kai was kind of getting at that, you know, you, 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 you've got to be able to take some risk, make investments in, in, in areas, in people and systems in particular. But 
I fully believe if we're really talking about seeing the future and seeing the future opportunity, we've got to see our residents differently. And we've got to work with our frontline staff to see our residents. Doesn't mean they don't have enormous needs of uh, uh, ADL needs and, and, and so on and so forth. But I really believe that uh, communities that in the future will be known just, not just by who the residents were and what they did, but who they still are and what they do. They're gonna be seeking that, that sense of, of purpose and connection and engagement. Yes, it's going to fit whatever are the limitations they have, but I think we've, you know, we're, we've, we've had it easy with the last 30 years, and we've had a model that fundamentally has you know, worked pretty well. Never got past 10 to 11% penetration, but you know, overall has worked, worked pretty well. Um, I, if, if we really want to see the, seize the future, we've got we to gotta think differently about the customer. And that's, to me, the most important thing. I, I see cool programs, but I oftentimes still see it's based on the same paradigm of thinking about the, the resident. Any other comments, any questions? Mel? Yeah, questions for the panel. Speak up a little bit. Well, first of all, it's already happening. That is to say, we've got, well, but it's, it's happening in society. That is to say, those of us who are in our 60s today, who have new knees, who survived cancer and heart disease, are on a path of wellness, or as Bob referred to it before, health span. That is to say, you get past 60, and you're not only after longevity, but good health. I think the practice of uh, promoting health um, is different than denying that we're older now. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really important, and Bob touched on this earlier, to embrace old age, but make it healthy and focus on wellness and prevention. A very large effort is underway. Also focus on purpose, and uh, I just saw a study uh, I'm on the board of the School of Gerontology at USC, and listening to the professors is like drinking from a fire hose, but I just saw a study where purpose has a greater effect on cardiac and blood pressure than, almost, than, than, than salt and all the other things you've been taught. So integrating purpose into our lives, whether we live in a community or not, what Bob called the post-retirement engagement, um, the refire, I think is going to be a huge part of health. The, the, uh, Lisa Ryerson, the president of the AARP Foundation, commented at uh, our Nick Talks last year. She used a, a challenge that I thought was great and a phrase that was great. She said that uh, she challenged us to rethink our activities directors as purpose matchmakers. Hmm. And I thought that was a fantastic phrase. Uh, uh, activities directors are kind of helping people pass the time and decline. Purpose matchmakers are helping you to refire and reconnect and feel that you, you, no matter what your limitations, there are still things you can do that meaningfully contribute to other people and to society and to help you find that. And I, I think that's a fantastic concept. I would agree with Patricia very strongly the goal is not to uh, grow younger. The, the goal is to embrace who we are and the age we are and the unique opportunities and, yes, challenges that come with that age. There are challenges with being 18 and there are challenges with being 88. They're very different, but the human desires are exactly the same. Well, look, 
maybe a little caution to the wind here. I think there are degrees of wellness. Okay, I, look, I, I get the fact that um, overall the standard for what, what we want as wellness has gone up, right? But there are still degrees of wellness. Some people want wellness to one degree, some people want it at this other degree. Like, you know, look, I pack my gym shoes all the time. I didn't use the fitness center this morning, right? I mean, there are degrees nice, of wellness. Nice muffin at Starbucks. I yeah, <laughs> look, I, you know, I, I worked at Canyon Ranch before. My old boss Gary is here, right? Healthy for the wealthy. Not everyone wants that level of wellness. So, you know, the, the one thing I would caution folks on is let's not, you know, say the entire baby boom generation fits into that bubble. Not really, right? There are degrees of wellness out there. So, you know, uh, and I say this because, you know, um, my guess is in you know, five years, the calls I'm going to be getting are for communities that have these wellness centers that, you know, that are, you know, what, 70% occupied and no one can fill them and they're calling me to try to help figure out what to do with them. Right? So again, let's be a little cautious in terms of let's not say that everyone wants it to the same degree. Uh, and by the way, look, you know, that degree of wellness comes with a price as well. You know, let's make sure that, hey, people expect certain things, and sometimes that comes with a price, and, you know, are we all going to provide that level of wellness moving forward? Everyone does have to be more cautious of it, more aware of it, changing dietary programs and things like that, but, again, there are degrees of it. I think a lot of these conversations are going to be happening throughout the day. If you look at the agenda, there are a lot of, you know, everything is about such and such solutions. So look at the agenda. So I think we're just kind of topping, stop, uh, the tip of the iceberg for a lot of these topics. Um, so I, I, I definitely recommend, let's have, keep thinking about risk, how we overcome risk, how we actually take risk as well. Um, and uh, in the interest of time, I think we're gonna wrap, wrap it up now. Michael, you got uh, yeah. any announcements? Well, I wanna thank Bob, obviously, again, for a great talk to talk about everything that's going on in the industry, and of course, to our panelists. Unfortunately, we are out of time. And as Charles was just saying, you know, we're gonna be diving into a lot of these topics later today and tomorrow. So thank you, Charles, for moderating the discussion. And Thank you, panelists.